It's September 10th, 2020. This is Rook. It is not exactly rare to hear an Iranian in the diaspora complain about our lack of recognition as a community. Don't they know how special we are? Well, not really. Between fighting stereotypes and misconceptions, Iranians don't often enjoy the social, economic, or political influence we feel we deserve in the West, that is, when we are visible at all. But can we really achieve recognition if we don't stand up to be counted? Bita Milanian is on a mission to make sure Iranian Americans are counted on the latest U.S. Census, and she joins us to explain and tell her story. Plus, extraordinary classical guitarist Lily Afshar, the first female doctor of music and guitar performance, joins us as well. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Welcome to episode number 43 of Rook. Salam, Dustan Aziz. Big Thursday show. The classical guitarist virtuoso Lily Afshar joins us from Memphis, Tennessee in about an hour from now. Keon, have you heard her play? I have not. Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Keon. Uh, she is. Uh, she's Thanks ex- for she's, putting me on the spot. Well, by the she's. Way. <laughs> ex- you will hear her play today. I will. She's I'm extraordinary. Excited. You know, she is. She was the first female to get a doctorate in yeah. uh, guitar performance. It's incredible. By her early thirties. How does that make you feel about that, yourself? I feel ashamed. <laughs> Why am I even here? I'll walk myself. I felt the out. same way. I understand. <laughs> no, she's remarkable. Uh, Bita Milanian is uh, just a few moments away uh, as well. Uh, she's joining us, uh, talking about trying to make sure Iranian Americans get counted in the U.S. Census going on right now, and to share her own story of how she came west from Iran and became such a ubiquitous presence in California communications and doing really important work for the Iranian community. Bita Milanian in just a few moments joining us. Uh, uh, Groovy Shai, can you turn my mic up a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Hello. Uh, thank you. Hi, Groovy Shai. Hello. The Hello. Uh, the, 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 it's Thursday, so the, the Thursday team is all here. Captain Reza. Hello. Groovy Shai. Hi. And the fabulous Keon. Hi, Gian. How's it going? How was your week? It's been very cold. I it's, think it's, it's becoming Zemestun already. Oh, yeah. We went from Tabestun depre- to Zemestun with nothing in between. So depressing. And they're talking about that inevitable second wave that's coming. So that's Ooh. that's scaring me a little bit. I don't yeah. know. I do not. I cannot handle another lockdown. You cannot. No. I know. You get squirrely. I gain too much weight. You get squirrely. <laughs> squirrely? Squirrely, yeah. And what does that mean? It means that... <laughs> 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 I, think, I physically I turn into a squirrel. Shia, what do you think squirrely means? Squirrel means no, that's squirrel actually. It's squirrel. <laughs> I don't know. It's squirrel. You know, you know what a squirrel is? A squirrel. The that's right you miss the moosh Sanjo. Sanjo. okay so uh <laughs> squirrely means um uh antsy like you you you, you want to get things uh uh, Captain Reza, look up squirrely. Exactly yeah. like what a squirrel does. How he uh. reacts, that's how you, when yeah. you react so like you a get, squirrel, you get, you get During squirrel. COVID, no, you no, get squirrely. No, not that. No, I do not get squirrely. <laughs> <laughs> I just, like, how do you keep yourself busy? I mean, there's, like, uh, cooking. That's the only thing I can do. <laughs> like, the thing with we've Toronto here, is. We've been here. We've been here working with the whole time. You wear a mask and you come and you work at Rook. <sighs> Well, you don't. You come in once a week, and you know, <laughs> in my tennis gear, <laughs> in your tennis gear. And it's better to wear a mask in the winter because you know it keeps you warm. Hmm. Yeah, well, these are the perks of the second wave. We're trying yeah. to turn it around. I, I actually, I, I noticed a lot of people uh, since quarantine. A lot of people have been desperate to find a partner. Suddenly, that's that's interesting, isn't yeah, it? Are you including yourself in that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So, look at today's program. <laughs> <laughs> no, what, I what shot made you think of that? You, that I, I, you honestly, thought of a second wave and I, you thought about so partnership. It's so funny. Suddenly, people that I would have never expected reaching out and like, oh, like, are you still single? And um, 
people just suddenly are so mm-hmm. desperate to find someone to quarantine with. Well, I think it would it's, be it would be you know people are excited about the poss- possibility. Yeah, of but people that I would never expect. Well, not just well, that. If they're it, reaching friends out with too. You. Friends of friends reaching out. Like, do you know anybody that's single? Like, <laughs> really? Like putting it out there. Like anybody out there. <laughs> So, so. Uh, maybe so. The, yeah, I think that probably makes sense. That yeah. you know, people are looking for partnership, uh, somebody to hibernate with. It's true. Right? Yeah. You know why? Why? Because people are getting squirrely. <laughs> yeah, I guess so they're getting I squirrely. Still, I That's still don't understand that. Anyway. Did you look it up, Captain Reza? No, I didn't. Can you put? Uh, sure. I mean, San Jobi. What San I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what does it refer to? <laughs> Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a whole episode. Why is a, on why this. Is a squirrel called a sand job? Because it's sand job. I, I know, but because wha- uh. usually Farsi is so literal, it would be like mouse with a bigger tail or something. Like they come up with some word, <laughs> oh, you know. Yes. Like like isn't giraffe? What's the word for giraffe? Zarafe. Zarafe. But there was another. Uh, the original word for giraffe is like camel with a longer neck or something. <laughs> you know <laughs> really? what my favorite is? <laughs> Shotor mor. No, that's yeah, Shotor mor. Shotor mor, oh, Shotor mor is, is perfect. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I love that word. Yeah. yeah. So I expected squirrel would be something like that too. Yeah, no, what does it say? Squirrely. An example of someone who would be described as a squirrely <laughs> is a fidgety, nervous person. There you go. Yeah, fidgety and nervous. I just get bored, okay? okay yeah, like maybe, indoors yeah, yeah. all the time. No, right. not squirrely. <laughs> not squirrely. <laughs> all right. Well, we've all learned something. Yeah. I'm not sure what it is. We've learned sand job and mm. to get antsy in uh, for in uh, in Iranian getting antsy is sanjabi. <laughs> right? Uh, we learn nothing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. I became sanjabi. Yeah. Um, this is next week on the program. Fadi Zolan, the master of song. Uh, this this is this man is extraordinary in terms of his catalog of hits he's written for these Persian legends. Um, Kugush, Haide, Abi, Dariush. The list goes on and on and on and on and on. on. Um, he's going to be joining us for a feature interview uh, to talk about his story and, and and all of his remarkable work, but also to talk about the fact that he falls into this category of this creative class of of Iranians, iconic Iranians in, in his case, who are not compensated for the creative work they've done. So uh, the copyright, uh, the, 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 the royalties, the recognition, he really gets none of that for all these songs he's written. We're going to talk about that with him he's asked to do the interview in farsi and in english or he doesn't feel that comfortable in his uh, uh english so I'll do, I'll do it in farsi with him we'll see how it goes but but i'm very excited uh farid zoland coming up on the program of course if we do it in uh, farsi we'll put uh, uh english subtitles on it on on our youtube channel or we'll figure out what to do um i know we had a lot of comments about uh our most recent or second most recent episode uh, last week with uh, Behdad Esvahbud, right? Yeah, we have a few coming up all in the letters. All right. So we're going to deal with that in letters of the week. Also, I have a I have a story to tell you, Kian, about um, Reza, Shia, and me, and um, uh, too many chicken wings. Mm-hmm. Too many chicken wings and Iranian pazirai mixed together. We'll... we'll We'll do that when we where do the letters. Where was my invite is what it, I'm well, thinking. <laughs> I'll tell you where your invite was. You never come. You never invite no, me. No, 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 no. We oh. always invite you. The whole group actually, right. oftentimes, like Susan, Ponta, Sarah, everybody come. You never come. I'm so offended right you're, now. You, you're on the night of, you usually go, sorry, guys. No. I'm that was going me. on another date. One or time. whatever it is that you <laughs> busy well, doing. Well, how about you guys invite <laughs> me next time? All right. So we'll get to the letters of the week. Uh, we'll get to Lily Afshar in about a, an hour. We'll get to the story of chicken wings. Um, but first, our feature guest. Well, here's a question that is undeniably relevant for anyone of Iranian descent living outside of Iran in the world. And here it is. Can those of us in the Iranian diaspora really achieve influence, recognition, or even status as a community if we don't stand up to be counted as ourselves? 
This is particularly relevant to the United States this year, where there is a huge Iranian community, as you know, and where there is not only a major presidential election going on, but also a census being taken for the first time in a decade. This would be to identify exactly who the citizens of the U.S. are and what communities have large enough populations to deserve recognition and benefits. Now, Iranians have been traditionally reticent to put their hands up and be counted in America for a number of reasons perhaps, and at least one woman wants to change all that. Bita Milanian is the national chair of Iranians Count, a public awareness campaign to encourage Iranian Americans to participate in the 2020 census. Of course, if you live in California and are involved with the Iranian community at all, you are likely already familiar with Bita. She is an Iranian American uh, communication strategist, a community leader, a producer, a radio host, a blogger, a creator of a popular food series called Bita's Kitchen. She's also the former executive director of the Fat Hang Foundation. Bita was born in Iran, spent some of her formative years in Germany, and now calls the United States home, and she is currently the Senior Vice President of Global Marketing at Ribbon, and she is trying to get as many Iranians counted as possible in the next month. And right now, Bita Melanian joins me from Los Angeles, California. Hello. Hello to you, Jian Jun. Thanks so much for having me and this uh, lovely introduction. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I want to get into your story, Bita, but uh, let's start with the immediate precipitant for having you on our program. Why is it important? Do this in a nutshell. Why is it mm -hmm. important for Iranian Americans to participate in the 2020 census in the U.S.? Participating in the 2020 U.S. census, which, as you mentioned, happens every 10 years, determines the future of our voice in the community, a community where for the past four decades, Iranians as a fairly new immigrant community have had so much impact, have contributed so much, yet we're not accounted for as a minority group, similarly to the Italian American community and Chinese American community and so forth, who have been here much, much longer. And as a result, they have been accounted for because they have responded to the U.S. census over the years, so that they have that checkbox. And as a you know, as as a minority group, there is a whole series of benefits that come along with it, and the list is so long. But among them include um, funding within, let's say, a hospital to have Persian language services available for the elderly. There will be educational um, scholarships or fundings, special special fundings allocated to the minority groups, similar to the Hispanic community, where, you know, if there is a student who does not, uh, who's not able to, you know, pay for their tuition, there's special funds that get allocated to minority groups, and the list goes on and on and on. So I can't um, uh, really go through all of them on, in this podcast, because it's really important for us to educate ourselves. And there is information readily available, as you mentioned, on the Iranians Count website. By the way, even sitting here in Toronto, in other words, outside of the United States, and and I feel like people listening in Germany or London or, or even Australia, there is something, because you guys, the Iranian Americans, because the diaspora really found its, its growth in the United States first, in fact, probably where you are right now, if not D.C., California, mm -hmm. It feels like your the Iranian Amer Americans being empowered is something that's going to help help Iranians around the world in the diaspora. Would that make sense? Absolutely. Los Angeles is known to be the largest community of Iranians outside of Iran, with Toronto following. Um, I think we're like kind of um, toe to toe, like where you guys are catching up with us. But Los <laughs> Angeles is that hub, and you know. Uh, Indeed, I, you know, I see it as somebody who's been so involved with the community for the past 20 plus years that, you know, everybody looks to Los Angeles and the activities in Southern California when it comes to any sort of movement that ha takes place outside of Iran, especially. You were also chair of the Iranians Count campaign in 2010. And, and because I was, uh, you know, leading up to this interview, thinking about you and, and doing the research, I was actually shocked at what I found, which is that. In the last official census, the count mm -hmm. of Iranians in the U.S. 
is a few hundred thousand. In other words, we know, I mean, we just had uh, Dr. Abbas Milani on last week who was talking about a couple of million Iranians in the U.S. alone. So that means that the count has been far less than the actual Iranians who are in the United States. Hold Let's say that in the last 10 years, a, a bunch of, uh, it's grown by some numbers. But mm-hmm. but why are, so, so, so what I'm learning from this or what I'm supposing or surmising is that uh, Iranians are not counting themselves somehow. Why are Iranians so reticent to participate and be counted in a census? Well, it's a great question. I think it has so many different layers to answer it. But I think traditionally, not just the Iranian community, generally speaking, the minority communities um, have been hesitant with responding to any sort of quote unquote government surveys or questionnaires. I think, you know, the immigration issues and the fact that somebody's going to come knock on your door and ask you, you know, who are you? What are you? I mean, that I think the fear that has been culturally, historically um, been developed in our minds has, has carried over to here, living here in the U.S., whereas, you know, all the information that the census asks is something that's already readily available. You know, if we're worried in that regard, it's already, you know, recorded. The census it acts as a third party to capture this data. So there is a legitimate independent entity who's um, providing this data that is used for so many different reasons. So I think it's more of a um, hesitation of sharing your information with a government entity where uh, this this whole uh, fear comes in. Um, I, I can't explain it any other way. Last time in 2010, again, I, I also want to clarify here, I'm not doing this alone. I, I'm the elected chair, but there are so many uh, partner organizations, media outlets, individuals who are part of this Iranian committee working together with the U.S. Census. Um, so I'm not doing this all alone. But um, So last time, t- 10 years ago, when we gathered all the different community leaders, celebrities to come help us with the PSAs. Maz Jobrani did a fantastic, um, you know, comedy. And we have to have a voice and have to be accounted for and have that little box that says Iranian on that census form. And in order to achieve that, we need to hit a one million count. Until then, we're not going to be accounted for. And how hard is it? I mean, I tend to say a lot of things on this program that, you know, I I sort of roll my eyes and go, oh, Irania, it's so (laughs) hard to get us to do everything as a community. And and there's such disunity and there's uh, but but, you know, in 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 granular terms, I mean, you know, on the in grassroots terms, how hard is it to corral the Iranian community to do something like this, even though on the face of it, it's quite simple, really? Mm -hmm. Well, I have to give credit uh, where it's due always. Uh, Iranian community has been labeled as not being able to work together, but I have witnessed, especially the past seven, eight years, um, here in Southern California specifically, so many nonprofit organizations, the key larger nonprofits that are working in different arenas, truly supporting each other, coming together, creating um, alliances when it comes to a specific project or initiative. So I have seen improvement in that regards. They attend each other's fundraisers, they support each other, and, you know, you know, whatever it is that they're doing in the different missions. So there has definitely been improvement. And this Iranian Complete Count Committee is another great example. Uh, if friends go on the website Iran's Count, you'll see how many partner organizations across the nation have partnered up. So there is definitely if improvement in that regards as far as the community working together especially on a you know nonpartisan initiative like this um, I think it's the community itself the individuals that sometimes may not you know follow through and I have to also say this time around the 2020 census overlap with so many distractions I would like to say you know from the movements that happened in Iran with the you know protests in late 2019 followed by the airplane crash and then we have COVID-19 so there has definitely been a lot of distraction this time around which didn't help our meaning um, that's taking the bandwidth in social media for example exactly 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 and also again you know when when Iran is uh, portrayed in a negative um, context whatever it is you know from you know Soleimani being killed to an airplane crash intentionally happening people Iran you know or any other like where you become more protective of do I say I'm Iranian? Do I, you know, keep that, you know, on the radar? So unfortunately, we've had those um, incidences that have, I think, impacted this round of census, which mm. again, it's every 10 years. But the good news is we have till end of September 30th, 
which is the extended deadline due to COVID again. So I hope this 30 day countdown that we have as of now um, will be, and I'll be pushing it and I'll, I'll, other partner organizations will be helping too. So we can hopefully ramp up the numbers and hit a 1 million count. So th- th- there's the fear that Iranians can feel um based on external stereotyping or uh, negative images and and certainly anybody who grew up in the you know who was in the west like I was as a kid in the early 80s you know would remember that and and how even my parents were afraid to say we're Iranian because of the way mm-hmm. we'd be uh, treated or talked about or or targeted um but there, there's something else too, which is uh, there is a, and, and this is just a theory. I mean, you can tell me whether this is uh, true or not. There is a hesitance, as you know, for all kinds of reasons, which we don't need to get into in this conversation because they're mm-hmm. they're so uh, it's it's such a minefield. But there is a hesitation among some Iranians to be to identify as a minority or to identify as, uh, masalan ethnic or people of mm-hmm. color or something like that. And so mm-hmm. uh, you. No, there, the, I wonder if that plays into this at all. I think we're a proud um, community. I think that's that's a, that's how I would describe us. You know, um, as as proud we are being Iranian because I get criticized sometimes not speaking Persian, even though I'm fluent Persian. But my audience tends to be you know English speaking, whether they're Iranian or non-Iranian. And I get criticized by friends living here in the U.S. Why aren't you speaking Persian more, especially on my cooking channel? And, you know, my answer is, you know, I'm living here in the U.S. You know, I need to assimilate. I need to, you know, this is my primary language. You know, this is where I was, you know, brought up. And I've been here outside of Iran for 33 years. But at the same token, you know, when you bring up something like this, you know, that if you count yourself as an Iranian, you know, you have all these benefits that come along with it. Then we have this shift of, you know, oh, no, I don't want to say I'm Iranian. So I, I, I'm yet to <laughs> figure it all out. But the good news is I see the new generation of Iranian Americans, even those born here, uh, passionate about, you know, searching their roots and going back to the roots and celebrating it. And, you know, I just had an interview with the young student body in Florida, South Florida, um, who's come together and they want to talk about issues with the Iranian community, about politics, about social issues, That's great. meeting successful. I, it's so uplifting when yeah. I see that. So every time there is a little bit of these kind of a negative notions of, oh, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to assimilate. I don't want to talk about being Iranian. Then I see the next generation. And that's when I get my, you know mojo going again to keep uh, pushing forward on these issues let me uh so let's let's park the census for a second as important mm-hmm. as it is and even though it has mm-hmm. been the precipitant for this conversation uh, because i want to ask about your story and your and, and this mm-hmm. a-type personality you have because you are involved in so much and you are so mm-hmm. incredibly driven and i'm curious where all that comes from so let's let's just go step by step here you were born in tehran you say yeah. that you have uh, I saw you in, in, in one interview talk about having fond memories of being a kid in Iran, uh, but you've also mm-hmm. talked about uh, uh, those being difficult times after the revolution and with the war. What what do mm-hmm. you remember about being a kid in Tehran? Ironically, even though I, when I, I left Iran, I was 13, I remember so much of it and like so many details. I remember streets. I remember like corners like that we would go to get ice cream like things that i remember vividly are astonishing to me myself and when i tell people you know you go up that street and then you make your left and then in that corner there is this you know shop that we used to go to and people like why do you remember that so i think it's something that some of us have within us certain things that we carry within our soul forever that are important to you that they, they stay with you and I think when you do things with passion I ever since I was a kid I remember whatever I did I did it full force all the way like I did, did you it, have a like, big personality as a kid would, would it be clear to anyone meeting Bita as a no. nine-year-old that you were going to go into communications no I don't think I had a big per- I actually I think was very shy but I was always very involved and active I was always part of something you know I was whether it was being in theater in school or um, managing the stand kiosk at the school. <laughs> right. like I would be char- in charge of that during breaks. And then from there, I would go and uh, be the captain of the basketball or ping pong team. So I was very involved always uh, as far back as I remember. 
Um, but I don't remember myself being a being an outspoken person or being a big personality person. I just was a doer. I was always somebody who was had the project manager, you know, attitude and just you know very focused. And I think it was I have that combination. My personality is definitely a combination of my both my parents. Uh, my father is a very outgoing, social person. You know, but you know loves to have fun and ha- loves to have lots of friends and my mom was the more structured she was the accountant very disciplinary so i have basically the combination of their personalities for sure but i didn't really come out to be this person that I'm today until much later in life i think i want to say in my maybe late 20s early 30s where i became more of myself and of course maturing and ex- life experience and yeah. Let, let's let's get to that you you but first, I mean, I'm just thinking about you, and I'm thinking, so you're in Tehran. You were probably around mm-hmm. six or seven years old when the revolution yes. happens. What mm-hmm. What do you remember about that time? Um, I don't remember. Uh, I remember vaguely, like, you know, the, the Hukumat Nazami, like those moments, like, you know, the martial law that, would, that was put in place and we had to hide. And then I fast forward, I remember the war because it happened so quickly the iran iraq war and then i remember you know living off of you know coupons like you know having just a little bit of you know frozen meat that you could get at the time because of the all the um shortage in food and my grandmother um bless her soul whom i never got to see again who raised us you know after we left and she passed away when we left would make us the most delicious lunch with that little bit of you know food that she, we would be able to source out whatever and it's just like i have those kinds of memories and then i remember the bombings and going under the bunkers and then next thing you know like we you know i almost got arrested because i was wearing a colorful scarf at age 12 12 and a half whatever nice. it was and then yeah. Uh, so there's like those kinds of memories, but I, I somehow I put don't think about those negative um, times. I think about my friends and the fun things that we used to do. Uh, like that's what I always my brain goes towards that direction versus the negative stuff. And then moving, you know, to Germany was another whole story. Well, starting, you, you, know, you know, it's so. it's interesting because so many folks. I mean, there's this big wave of immigration, especially to where you are right now, Los Angeles to Mm -hmm. California, right at the time of the revolution, in those years, you know, between 78 to 81. I mean, there's, as we now know, the flight of intellectuals and all that leaving Mm -hmm. Iran. You guys don't actually leave until 1986. So I'm I'm curious what the, what the precipitant was for that. And, and, And it was also particularly difficult because as I understand it, you leave with your mom, but mm-hmm. your brother, your father, your grandmother are staying back in Tehran, right? So mm-hmm. um, t- tell me about how all of that happened and why Germany? Yeah, so that period was the most difficult period to leave Iran, like uh, to get your passports, visas, what have you. And Germany at the time one of, was one of the very few countries that was um, giving political asylum, uh, refugees, uh, accepting refugees at the time. Um, that was actually providing social services and housing and what have you. Now, you couldn't go to Germany entering as a refugee. You would have to make your way into Germany and then come up with an excuse why you want to stay as a refugee. So it was, but they were a lot more um, um, flexible, I should say, at the time. So my parents always fought before the revolution about leaving Iran. My, my uncle, my Amo, left Iran way before like 19 late 76 77 he moved to the us and then he stayed and my father always wanted to leave iran because my his brother brother had moved to the us my amo fears prior to the revolution had made a life here with his wife and eventually children and my mother always was very attached to her family and you know very much you know we don't leave our country we stay in iran no matter the breaking point mom finally give in was when i almost got arrested by the um you know passed that on (laughs) for no reason because I was wearing a colorful scarf and that's a whole other story but um so because my mom worked for always for you know German companies or German affiliated companies and knew some German she had connection with the German embassy so we got a visa to leave as as a tourist visa and at the time I had relatives living in Germany uh, who now live in Canada and we stayed with them for a a week or so and then we did our research my mom did her research where do we go from here and we found out the city of Cologne, Cologne uh, has better because they also have the 
different states, similar to Canada and U.S., different areas of Germany have different regulations and rules when it came even with immigration issues. So we made our way to Cologne and slept in an apartment with four other families uh, who were there also to seek, you know, um, political asylum or refugee status in Germany, a family who took us in. And in the morning, age 13, almost 13, we go to the police department, Jun, because that's how you uh, register yourself or introduce yourself to the German government. You go to the police department. So just imagine me, I'm 13. I have never been to the police department because I know police department as a place where you get in trouble, right, right? Right. So we finally make our way there and they reject us. This was actually a city outside of Cologne. And they tell us, everybody go back to the city you originated from. Anyway, this, the story is very long, but we ended up finally getting settled in Cologne and my mom and I being single like she was a single mother with a young girl they put us in a better housing versus the others got shipped to some um, outside of the city little villages so I was lucky enough to be in an, uh, in an area where people around me you know we had a German man who was the manager of that place we were staying at recognized my capabilities and abilities and took me to this gymnasium I think I'm talking too much. This, this story is so long and so <laughs> it's emotional. Okay. So I'm talking it's too okay, much. No, yeah. I think, so this, this thing is... Um, oh, I don't talk about it much, but... Um, okay, so I'm going to shorten it because this, this, this is a... Tell me why you're getting emotional. Because that those months that were the most difficult months at the time that I didn't even think about those months being my difficult months are the foundation of who I am today. The the difficulties that I experienced then, my mom right away went into surgery. I had to stay by myself in that place that we're staying. And I had other families, this, this Polish family helped me. So I think all those experiences of Wait a minute, you're, you're, th hmm. you're 13. You're a 13-year-old mm -hmm. Persian girl. Mm -hmm. You're mm -hmm. in a new country. You're in Germany, and you're you're staying with a Persian, a, a Polish family, and yeah. and your mom has to go for this is this is harrowing stuff. <laughs> no, and also you've left half your family behind in Iran. That mm -hmm. that's scary mm -hmm. too, right? You're wondering. I'm sure you were wondering what what, what was happening with your dad or your or your brother or or whether right. whether they've changed, whether they're different people, whether they're okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and. So, yes, my mom ended up having emergency surgery. So she was away for almost a month or so in the hospital back then. I guess you stayed longer in the hospital. I don't know. I don't remember why that was. So I think one, one of the reasons I am doing so much with maybe giving back and helping other people or being so involved with my community is that those experiences that I had as a young teen where I saw people coming together, helping each other while we worked hard to build our lives all over again as much as we had emotional challenges you know with being away from family and loved ones you know you I just had to figure it out like I had no choice you know I just had to make the best of the situation I was in and that's why I think I worked hard in learning German I learned German under six months I was fluent in it my German teacher in German class told the students to come to me for their German homework. And that was my first wow. rewarding moment that if you work hard, you get recognized like this. I was embarrassed. But uh, it was also at the same time a, a, a moment where like, wow, if I work hard and I excel and I succeed, I get rewarded like this. I get recognized like this. So I should work hard all the time and, you know, make the best of what I have. So, um yeah, so those were the early days. <laughs> you know, um, I'm grateful for you to the way you're opening up about this. This is a uh, because it. To be honest, this is uh, every every. I'm betting you know almost any Iranian listening to this right now understands this story because we've all been through some version of this. Um, mm -hmm. You know, even in my case when we came from England to Canada, uh, you know, and I'm coming to a new country. I don't, um, I'm this Persian kid, but I, I grew up in England and my dad mm -hmm. came here first and, and for, for nine months we, I was just with my mom and my sister. And uh, these are, you know, these have, they, there's a major impact that 
all of this has. And in your case, there's a second migration, because then just as you're getting settled into Germany, you move mm-hmm. to the United States. Um, mm-hmm. And as the story goes, and and I don't want to just harp on the on the uh, the negative stuff, but this is um, this is building character stuff, right? As the story goes, yeah. you feel like when you come to America, you finally arrived in this land of peace and positivity and opportunity, and then you and your family are directly involved in an earthquake in California in '94. Mm-hmm. Tell tell us what happened and how that affected you. That was definitely another growth moment for me. I remember that night and the next morning, the morning of, because it happened at 4.30 in the morning, uh, I was about 19. We had finally, you know, when we moved to the U.S., it was very difficult. We lived in that one-bedroom apartment, which many immigrant families during those times recall. But those one-bedroom apartments were the funnest, by the way, because we made the best of it and we had the best parties with the small families that were here. Uh, versus today where everything is so elaborate. So, um, yeah, so we had just moved into this, you know, nice apartment near my college, Cal State Northridge. Finally, my parents, myself, I had bought my first car myself. I was you know, happy. It was, everything was going so well, you know, finally settling in after five years of being in the U.S., almost five years. And, you know, the Northridge earthquake happened, and we're smack in the middle of it. And we get woken up by this, you know, explosion sound. And we rush down the, you know, we had this really nice, you know, duplex um, apartment. And finally, we make our way outside of the apartment. That whole 20, whatever, 45 seconds was like the longest 45 seconds of my life. And we finally make it out of the apartment. And I turn around to see if my father is following us. And I see the entire building basically come down like scary movies that you see like people are running and the building crashes so that's what i witnessed and we were outside for hours so your home your your home you're talking about your home burned down yes yes. not burned down it it crashed down it came down one story so we were like it's like the garage first level second level so this entire second level like tilted down and came down on the first level on top of our cars and i mean it was it was quite a scene so, you know, it was in January, so it was cold. Yes, you know, January nights here and evenings are usually cold anyway. And the next morning, I and the night before, I had gone out with friends. It was a friend's um, grand opening of his brand new business. So we all had dolled up. We had gone out and all my, you know, jewelry that I had already bought for myself at age 20 and all my things at the time that were valuable to me. They were just sitting on my desk, even though it was all tilted and all over the place. So I walk into my room. Just go. I was the first person, the only person out of that whole entire um, apartment building of maybe 40 units. I was the first person to in to check things and also grab our green card at the time, some cash, some, you know, just like basic stuff and come out because there were still aftershocks and it was not safe to go in. And I looked at my room and I remember I had a Marilyn Monroe, huge Marilyn Monroe photo on top of my bed that had just fallen down, I had glass and had fallen on my bed. So if I had not gotten up earlier, it would have been over my head. And I just looked at everything and I had this like moment with myself for like 30 seconds, just looking around. What's going on here? You fled Iran, you you know, Iran, Iraq war where there was bombing down the street and you, you know, safely out of that. And then you go to Germany, you go through all those hardships and then you come here and this happens to you. You know what, Bita, none of these material stuff all around you, they mean nothing. They can be taken away from you any second. So do not be hung up on them. That's when my um, detachment to things, to material things happened from there on. Don't get me wrong. I love beautiful things. I love having nice things, but I'm totally detached from it all. So yeah, that was my other. It kind would of- it would also be a, an education in um, mm-hmm. in what home means to you because mm-hmm. you've because you had one home in Iran, then you got displaced, yeah. and you have another home. Uh, I mean, not just the houses, but the home. You know, right. uh, where right. you identify in Germany. Then you come to the yeah. U.S. and your physical home crumbles in front of your eyes. Um, mm-hmm. And I wonder about your self identity. You know, uh, you know, you know. One of the un- underlying constants with this show that um, we've been doing is this umbilical cord we all seem to have with Iran and being Iranian. No, no, no matter how many years we've been in the diaspora. I mean, even in my case, if you grew up entirely outside of Iran but with Iranian parents, 
I'm I'm curious about you in this respect. How someone who has spent so much Dorosta, you were there until you were 13, mm-hmm. but you spent so much of your life outside of Iran. You could uh, just talking to you, it's clear, knowing you, seeing you, you could easily integrate into Western circles and say communications and PR. But you're mm-hmm. still so tied to being Iranian, to working for and with our community. Uh, how do you describe that that connection? You know, that's a great question I ask myself all the time. Um, I think it had maybe something to do with the fact that I initially, when I was ready to start doing community work, which I remember vividly, was early 2001, um, when I was introduced to a local charity and I started helping them and really taking my professional experience at the time and applying it to helping that particular organization. And then from there on, I started building this reputation of somebody who organizes things, who knows how to communicate, who's this PR person. I didn't even know what the word PR meant at the time back <laughs> in 2001. I'm like, what? What is PR? And I, I ended up being known, and it's funny that you also referenced me that, that I'm this PR person, just somebody who can communicate and you know put things together. And I did so many uh, projects at the time with that organization and then from there on um i guess i had it like in my essence i felt good i felt reconnected to my roots i mean that's the only way i can explain it and then later on getting involved with the arts and helping artists especially up and coming artists not mainstream pop culture artists which is also very important but i felt this connection to the artist community that was underrepresented that i felt that introducing those artists who can be crossed over to mainstream puts a positive you know has a positive impact in the overall global community the way they look at us because you know we started having the access of evil situation happening back then it was right yeah. after 9 11 so i think with all you know in my subconscious i started getting reconnected to my community because i was also watching what was happening in the world and how iran was being perceived and now i was in a position where i can make a difference, but it wasn't planned. It just happened all organically. And then from there, it just took off. And so the, uh, so, so, so the beta today, if you were, mm-hmm. if it wasn't COVID, that is, if, and, and you're on, mm-hmm. hol- and you're on holiday in, in, in Italy and someone says, Oh, mm-hmm. where, where are you from? Uh, mm-hmm. wh- what's your background? What do you say? I definitely say I'm Iranian and live in the U S you know, I'm an Iranian American. Um, it's funny. I went back to Germany on my 30th anniversary of leaving Germany, and it just so happened, this, which was last um, March, March of 2019. I, I looked at the calendar, and I was like, wow, this is my exactly the same weekend I left Germany 30 years ago. Oh my gosh, it's also carnival. By the way, when I was in Germany, I was also part of the marching bands that marched the carnival. Of course, I you were. The pic- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how that, that's another great example of. By the way, you also left the year that the wall came down. I think. I, so the, when I left when I left Germany the next year it happened. Yeah. Yeah. So, so dramatic. So, so I, dramatic. What? Well, uh, 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 leaving I the leave Germans. They, were, they brought the wall down. <laughs> yeah. They were like, you know what? Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, Back to 2019, I returned to Germany, and it's carnival, it's fun, it's happening. And on the final day, which is called Rosenmontag, um, on Monday, we go to the final parade, and I'm on, on these bleachers, you know, we're all you know dressed up, it's fun, and everybody's you know talking to each other. And this German man comes up to me and you know starts talking to me, and I explain what's going on that I'm here after 30 years this is such an amazing you know thing for me to be able to come back and celebrate it this way back to the city where it gave me all these opportunities and this German man started crying and telling me how much he appreciated hearing that from me and took his pin there was this in in carnival there's this whole culture of you know different clubs different groups different communities and he took his pin that was this like beautiful like representation of the culture of germany and he took it off and he gave it to me and put it on my um collar and saying this is my gift to you thank you for sharing that story with me because so many times germans or alike hear so much negativity from people who come to their country and yes. are, are, are not appreciative so me sharing that story with him which was the, the as true as it could be, as genuine as it could be, you know, it's so important for us to remember the people, individuals at any scale in life that give us the opportunities to become the people that we come and not forget. And anyway, that was my beautiful moment. Um, 
hmm. uh, reconnecting with that. So you, you you talk about the last couple of decades, um, mm-hmm. opportunities um, arising for you that you take to help out to give back to the community, and you start um, becoming identified as as this person who is uh, somebody who's you know a, a mover and shaker, or somebody who is doing valuable work within the Iranian community, and particularly the Iranian American community. In California, a big part of this has to be the Farhang Foundation that you helped to grow, and be- you became the executive director at the Farhang Fand- Foundation. What yeah. What did you learn about the Iranian community in your years at the Farhang Foundation, or, or perhaps more specifically, what do you believe our global community in the diaspora needs to do better? The early years of me getting involved with the community professionally because I got involved I started working in the community doing my thing in 2000 2001 but professionally uh, it was really like you said in 2008 I first started my own PR communications agency called Butterfly Buzz in September of 2008 as a result at the same time Fahang Foundation was being established so I had to make a presentation like any other you know job apply for and the board reviewed it and you know I was impressed right off the bat to see a group of successful Iranian Americans coming together just for the passion of you know celebrating our culture and introducing it especially to community at large not just Iranians and um, that to me to be able first of all being given, given the opportunity to be a part of that and then eventually all the great things that we ended up doing for five full years and me eventually leaving my telecom career and committing myself full time to Firing Foundation and eventually in two, three years becoming the executive director and helps build it to what it is today was truly a rewarding experience as we learned so much together, as we, you know, were able to, to do so many artists and, you know, collaborate with so many museums and academic institutions. And then at the same time, the culture of fundraising and, you know, going out to the community, getting them involved to help with a project like the Freedom Sculpture, you know, that whole project started two, three years before the actual installation. And for me, being a part of that will forever be one of the biggest highlights of my, you know, career and my life. And during that period, I got to see how much um, love there is for our culture and our community within Um, you know, Iranian Americans who just want to give and who just want to support. And then I think from there on, other nonprofits also um, kind of started carrying on the same um, sort of structure. And I just have have, have been amazed to see the growth of the community in regards to giving back. And now fast forward, also seeing the Iranian American community on the political front getting involved and um, getting involved with the me, local let me, governments. Let me get yeah. there. But but I yeah. but I'm just curious, just because you're in an interesting position, you know, having mm-hmm. having been in the executive director of the Farhang Foundation and doing the kind of work you've done. I mean, uh, not not at all to minimize all the important things that that the foundation has done for in in terms of celebrating artists and planning events and and all all uh, and and you know. Uh, um, promoting the culture, et cetera. But what, what, what have you learned about our community? And um, again, I, I don't actually mean this in a negative way. I mean it in a proactive way. What, mm-hmm. what would you like to us, to, the, this community to be doing better? I would love to see our community be supportive of each other as individuals more than ever before. As I mentioned, the organizations, I see the collaborations happening. The, 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 on, on, the, on the community level, on individual level, I feel there is a disconnect. And the fact that we can't um, really align ourselves for certain you know, initiatives that are to the benefit of all of us, I see that still lacking. And the, I think it's also the competitive nature that we have in our community like i think iranians are very competitive and that's why they have excelled and succeeded Mm. but we can create you know we can use the competitive nature in also a positive way and i feel i I would love to see more of that happening um which i think is still lacking you have a blog and a podcast now Mm -hmm. called be the change what is the what is the change you most want to create acceptance appreciation understanding and just overall 
being part of every community that you're in, every single person, even if you say you're busy, you don't have time, there are small acts of kindness and, and goodness that we can each do in our own way that can you know, define us being a change maker. I started this blog in 2014 um, and, you know, I started highlighting individuals, not necessarily celebrities or, or public figures, everyday people who are being change makers. You know, I stopped writing last year because I've been busy, but then this year I started the radio version of it on a monthly basis, um, more focused on the immigrant um, community, Iranian American immigrant community. I just feel, you know, highlighting those individuals, especially who are underrated, they're not getting the spotlight. And remembering that everybody in every corner of the world is doing something that's making this world a better place. And this, especially in this era where the global community is suffering and is in pain, we need to be even more proactive in doing good. Nice. So, so to recap, you have your PR and communications company. You work with various foundations. You have the Be the Change podcast and and the sometimes blog. You you have a popular foodie program called uh, Bita's Kitchen, well, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and this is not to say anything about the Iranians uh, count uh, the census work. What, why are you so driven to do so many things? What, what's going on with you? Why? <laughs> what, what, what is what is it? What is it? <laughs> what is it? I guess ma- I, I I guess I like to keep busy. <laughs> no, but know. you do. But mean- this is this is more than busy. This is, yeah. this is you, you, I mean, you have to, if you don't have an answer to this, you, you need to sit down and think about it. Cause I'm really curious yeah. what it is, what, why you uh, feel the desire or need to do so many things. Honestly, I, I don't think about it. I just do it. I, it's one of those things that, you know, I, you know, let's not forget. I have a very sensitive full-time day job. Um, right. that is, you know, <laughs> you know, I work with like, uh, so it, somehow I figured it out and I have a balanced, um, life now. I didn't before I have to say I neglected my health. I wasn't sleeping enough. I had my own set of, you know, health issues that I, have you know, hopefully now conquered with being a little bit kinder to myself, you know, by doing self care, you know, whether uh. it's eating more properly, sleeping, dancing, exercising. So um so you you know you know how to do that balance now i guess i do now because i feel good i really i I think the past year especially has been one of my um best years for me personally feeling good about myself and feeling um really focused and strong and um driven and happy Mm. you know um i can't say i can't say that um as confidently prior probably to the past year. The past year, I feel like I found myself in some ways. Okay, so I, I, I know I can't keep you forever. Let's, let me- No, let me, let me, I'm let, having fun. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> Back to this year and the census mm-hmm. and the US election. I have to ask you about something very interesting before I let you go. And that is that, I mean, even though you are a kind of, I, I'm calling you this, you, you, this is not you calling yourself this. You, I think you are a kind of cultural ambassador and someone who is seen to be in, in the important circles or elite circles of the Iranian American community in California. Somebody who would, somebody one would think who would not want to rock the boat and, and would want to keep smooth relations with mm-hmm. everyone. You've chosen to take a side very publicly in the upcoming U.S. election. And, you know, uh, taking an anti-Trump position, say, from here in Canada or, for for that matter, anywhere else in the world might not be very controversial. But uh, where you're sitting and knowing the Iranian community as well in in California, this had to be a, a big decision for you. Tell me about it. I was, like you said, very um, non involved with the politics and you know being in the role that i have been promoting artists and different campaigns and nonprofits. i was always asked to help support you know political nominees within the iran american community and i always shied away from that because of that exact same reason that you mentioned having worked for a you know a nonpartisan uh, nonprofit also prevented me from doing that as well until the travel ban the travel ban like was the last like straw for me to, you know, I felt, you know, this is too much. This is where it's impacting people like myself. I'm here in America. I came here for all the great opportunities that I have. 
the 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 proper way, the legal way, the legit way. My parents worked so hard to start our lives over again at ages 45 and 50 from zero. And for me to be, you know, categorized and for people like me, and you know, who can come also to, to, to the U.S. and be, you know, have these opportunities, it just was like, oh, my gosh, what's happening here? So that's when I started becoming vocal about you know, you know, my stance where I am. And fast forward, you know, it's just gotten worse, you know, with with everything that's going on for all the the American dream that we all came to the US for is crushed, essentially, and it's going away. And I'm, you know, we used to be proud to say that I'm an, you know, that we're Americans when we travel to Europe, other parts of the world, and people dreamed of coming to the US. And that all of that is being taken away, and I just feel like I can no longer be quiet about it, and um, that's why I've chosen to become more vocal and stand for what I believe in. And you're you're actually uh, part of the the the, the Biden. You're so actively supporting the Joe Biden campaign, the Biden Harris campaign, I guess I would call it, right? There is a Iranian Americans for Biden campaign that has. Um, was, that was started a couple of weeks ago or um, over a month ago or so and i recently got more involved with them there is a very diverse group of young iranian americans young old everything between that is involved with this group and uh, they're working towards um you know helping raise funds for the campaign and raising awareness and why we need to vote for him versus the other this is no longer about a political party to me you know i'm not saying the democratic party is perfect either every you know every political party has their own flaws but um yeah, so I'm trying to help them as well and be a part of that movement. So, what has it been like putting uh, putting yourself out there and putting you know putting uh, the the Biden campaign poster on your social media platforms and and what kind of reaction have you gotten? Well, to say the least, it's been very entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> um, going back to what you asked me earlier about uh, what I would love to see in the Iranian American community happening is you know more than ever vivid here to see the divisiveness and obviously the divisiveness has, is happening across the world uh, across the nation and in all communities um with this election um yeah it's interesting i mean uh, i'm one person that's open-minded to all views i respect everybody i feel this is why we all came to america for the democracy that we get to experience and practice here and unfortunately i see that um, if I come and stand for, you know, let's say today with, you know, the Democratic Party and wanting to elect Biden as president, I'm criticized by the other side, whereas it can't be the other way around. If I were to criticize the other side, I'm bad, I'm the bad guy and the likes of me. So I, I hope to see more alignment. There is nothing wrong for you wanting to elect somebody else, but let's be respectful towards each other. Let's let's be kind to each other. Uh, I just feel that's fading away and it's creating this, you know, division between us that I hope uh, we can um, repair and um, make it, you know, go away. So in that, it's, in, it's that, just not- in that polarized climate and given that you have mm-hmm. pretty big platforms in social media, you have a lot of followers. Have you, have you been, I can only imagine you probably have been, I mean, uh, mm-hmm. uh, have you been excommunicated by, by certain contacts yeah, I, or, or I, friends or? Yeah, unfortunately, as recent as a couple of weeks ago, you know, three friends who were very close to me, unfortunately, and and the irony of it is some of these folks, they were pro Obama for the longest time. And then suddenly, I have no idea why. And with all the respect, I respect their change in opinion. They have switched to the other side. And again for for them to get upset with me to keep my stance because we never even had a political conversation with each other and just because i don't want to be as close to them any longer because of our different views and with them being extreme views and distancing myself it has upset them which is very ironic to me um so yeah it's it's unfortunate that's just one example i'm sure there are others who are not speaking up but uh and i'm not alone in this i have i see it especially being in part of that uh, iran americans for biden i see people are sharing their experiences close friends experiences that are you know where we talk to each other about it so yeah it's, it's you know, happening <laughs> th- there was something uh, i i recently uh, just a well just a, a couple of episodes ago we just had uh, um homo sarashara the legendary mm-hmm. journalist who I'm sure is a friend of you, you somebody you know. Yes, uh, my and, very dear friend. Okay, well, she, you know, I was very surprised when I said to her, 
Um, have you noticed over the last 40 years, so I'm dating it back to the revolution, right? Have you noticed mm -hmm. uh, in the day and when she came, uh, have you noticed a growing division in the Iranian uh, diaspora, mm -hmm. expecting her to say, man, yes, no, or if yes, you know, it's been this gradual, uh, you know, balkanization or something. Right. She said, uh, yeah, but not in the last 40 years, in the last four years. So she says, right on da point. dating back to the beginning of Trump, this Trump's administration and uh, you know post twenty sixteen has had a direct impact on dividing the Iranian community in the U S. Mm -hmm. in a way it wasn't divided before. So, can you speak to that? Is that is something you've noticed as well? Well, Mrs. Sasha is one of my idols, somebody I look up to. I call her my second mother, and she's right on point. I have never seen. I mean, I've also been involved like with the green movement we were united the, with with all these other you know situations you know that directly impacted iran we were all involved we've never seen this much divisiveness as we see the past you know three four years um sadly my immediate family that you know i don't want to say who i had to break contacts with him since travel ban who just refused to understand you know, what it means to me as an immigrant coming here because he had been here much longer. And we had this most loving relationship with each other. I respect him so much. And unfortunately, over, you know, Trump, we've lost all contact. And we don't even, you know, we we were un we unfriended each other on Facebook because we didn't want to see each other's posts. It's truly a sad, um, terrible situation that's happening, Jiang Jiang. And um, does it, definitely didn't need this. <laughs> does it hamper your? Does it hamper your abilities with Iranians? Count at all? Does, does people say, "Forget it"? I'm not participating in the census because you're now you're a Democrat or something like that. No, I mean, I, people don't know me as a, a in that context. I mean, when it comes to I me, mean, I stay behind the scenes with the Iranians. Count. I mean, I'm not really as local. Like, I, I mean, we're just sharing right, the right, content and right. hoping everybody else is doing the same. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think, I mean, people, wh whoever is, if they're truly, you know, understanding what the Iranians count stands for, then they shouldn't have anything to do with each other's political stance. But um, I, I, I'm, I'm not being, I'm not um, being um, negative. I, I am not, I'm still hopeful because I still, I also see so many people who are also wanting this change. And want to go back to the way we were <laughs> and um before all this madness you're so, talking about the um, u.s or iran or both right yeah u.s all right u.s yeah so um uh, listen I I'm I'm so grateful for the the time you've given us today I I want to I, I don't normally do this but, but but because I really believe in what you're doing with this census let's um let's give tell people exactly what how they can help or what is there a website or something that mm -hmm. you can tell people what, what, where, where should they go sure I appreciate that there is a website called iranianscount.org. Uh, it has all the information related to the campaign. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Iranians Count. And there is lots of content there, uh, videos, PSAs, um, material that uh, everybody can read and understand. But more importantly, it's important for everybody to share those contents. You know, we, we did all this in a very short amount of time with no budget. Everybody pitched in and helped create all these material, you know, from community leaders, you know, to celebrities, to everyday people, everybody came together to create this informative uh, material so that everybody can share them and educate their friends, family, loved ones who may have um, concerns with it. And we're, you know, the good news with the COVID-19 is that it's, again, it's extended through September 30th. This is our uh, final month to hopefully everybody participating so that we, when next year they tabulate and they uh, announce the uh, final numbers, we are at the million number. Good job, Pisa. Not, not, not bad for... Uh the girl who was the 13 year old kid who couldn't speak the language somewhere in Germany by herself living with a Polish family uh, try to figure out how to make it in the make make ends meet in the world uh, you've done great things and uh, I uh, celebrate uh, what you're doing with this census and I thank you so much for coming on the program I appreciate you having me on and um, look forward to seeing you in person soon hope to see you soon yeah let's get this uh, covid thing taken care of thank you yes. have an amazing day thank and you. thanks so much same to you bye -bye. thank you so much bye
Pizza Milani on, an Iranian American communication strategist, a community leader, producer, radio host, blogger, creator of a popular food series. That's Bita's Kitchen. You should check out as well. She is the chair of the Iranians Count campaign for the 2020 census in the U.S. Pizza Milani on joined us from Los Angeles, California today. Love that tune. Sabzim on Oz. That's the group Niaz from 2015. Niaz is uh, an Iranian duo. I mean, I think they've had a few members of the band, but uh, at the core, an Iranian duo um, who came from Iran. They live in California. They were in Montreal for a while. Uh, they have an, uh, an amazing story, and they actually have um, such great work that they've done. Their, their, their music is uh quite transporting and they are coming up on rook soon so stay tuned for neoz on one of our uh, upcoming episodes the thir- thursday team is back ruby shia Hi. captain reza the fabulous keon um what did you think of what uh, bita melanian had to say shia um first of all the census the census thing i think is really important i uh, i um, i have to thank her for um uh, for put her passion to do that yes and uh, beside that actually i i knew Bito uh, about f- 10 years ago while we w- while we had a tour in united states your band the dang show yes. when you played in the us and you yes. met her yes and Bito promote one of our shows in los angeles in lacma museum for farhang oh, foundation yeah okay. so i i knew Bito, Bito from there and Actually, for me, it was quite interesting that uh, I I had no idea about uh, her story. Yeah. And uh, he, he sir, so she had a tough life. Bef- I mean, she she uh, she made it by uh, hard yeah. working, yeah. and I I I was impressed. Actually, I really. I, I, I have to say exactly the same thing, but in the category of. In the category, actually, most human beings have incredibly complex lives, if you dig uh, b- below the surface, but uh, and have been through a lot. But particularly Iranians in the diaspora, as we've talked about many times, there's always a story, and in many cases, it's a heartbreaking story or a story of perseverance. And she certainly falls into that category. Exactly the same experience. I kind of uh-huh. knew Bita, knew of, you know, I, I thought of her as a high-powered, high, high-energy communications person in California who's done these things for the community, in fact, Hang Foundation, and uh, no, I had no idea that she came from. First of all, qu- quite modest roots, and, yes. and then and then had been through all the things along the way that she's she's been through, and uh, um, it gives me a whole new appreciation for all the work that exactly. she does. Yes. Captain Reza, uh, her story reminded me of Navid Negarban, who also went to Germany and has such a love of love uh, love for. Uh, Germany and the and the and, and Sepi de Nasiri also That's went right, to Germany. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If, what is it with the Iranians That's going to uh, Germany? Well, in some <laughs> cases, that was the trip, I guess. Yeah. Germany and then the U.S. for some. Yeah, but that was fascinating, and that that story when she was talking about uh, that uh, German guy that at uh, that festival giving her um, a little uh, medal or star or something like yeah. that, a piece of memorabilia, and that meant a lot to him. Well, she, you know what she was getting at there. I think she was drawing a the, the comparison or a metaphor between the, the German experience and the Iranian experience. Yeah. Obviously, vastly different. 
but she was saying that this guy was so gratified to hear somebody saying something positive about Germans True, yeah. uh, because usually people come from away and say something else. Yeah. So that he was he got teary. Yeah. And, and that's the case. That's often the way we feel if somebody says something. <laughs> it's like a couple of weeks ago when there was that CNN show and uh, W. Kamau Bell and there was some positive uh, portrayals of Iranians and we were like texting each other. Did you see that? Yeah. As, as yeah. if, you know, like a, yeah. it shouldn't be an event, but it was for us. Um, Keon? It's honestly, it's people like Bita that make me feel inadequate as a human oh, being. On. Like I do not do enough compared to this woman. And like Shia said, she had to overcome so much and had such humble roots to reach where she did. So I, I appreciate people like that. And um, you know what? It's the story she says about how she started um, in that one bedroom apartment and how honestly those were probably some of the be best days of our life and they just made the best of it they had these parties all the other iranian families would mm, get involved yeah. i've heard this so often and i that's such a beautiful thing to me that it makes it almost makes you think that some of the people with the big mansions should trade them in for yeah. one bedroom apartments yeah. because it's a, people have better times it's the, also yeah. stories of iranian families coming together that yeah. togetherness and like it's very rare we re rarely see that today and I, yeah you I think just, so I think so, yeah. I think the ones that came together and had to overcome so much um, during that time probably felt like they had to connect with other families and, you know, you're, you're in this together Maybe, sort of thing. Yeah. So. I mean, people are still coming, having to deal with a lot and, and coming as refugees or mm. seeking asylum or even have been here for a while but are yeah. dealing with the manifestations yeah. of years of... Uh, Issues. I have to say, I, I hear these stories more so from back then, not uh -huh, so much uh -huh, uh -huh. recently. I don't know why. I, I have no explanation for it, but it's interesting yeah. to me. Uh, I, I feel like it's so much harder to come to travel as a refugee and with fake passports and stuff like that mm. nowadays as opposed to, obviously, when like you did it. When you did it. Yeah, back then you could have uh, changed the picture of the passport. Now it's all wow. digital and computerized and stuff Crazy. like that. I don't so know that speaking works. of um, Persian Mehmunis, uh, so last week, uh, me and Reza and Shia, uh, not the rest of the gang, but the three of us, we decided to go uh, watch sports. Remember when we, you and I would go, Keon, and watch the Raptors, the Raptors game, games? Yeah. yeah, a bunch of us would go. I mean, you just haven't been available. It was just boys' night, I because guess. Because you're <laughs> because you're dating so much, you're oh, not wow. as available. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so Reza and Shia and I go to the sports bar. Do you, you know, St. Louis. There's a Saint Louis. Yes, I do. I'm chain, familiar no, with Saint Louis. Well, uh, not everybody knows. I mean, I think it's a Canadian chain. It or is something. a Canadian yeah, chain. Yeah, yeah. So it's a Canadian chain. It's kind of like a, a sports bar slash wing place, mm -hmm. and you know. So we go to a Saint Louis because we want to watch the, the the Raptors and and uh, and uh, you know we order some wings and stuff. And then it turns out the owners of the Saint Louis, uh, like a sports bar, like a, with the chicken wings and stuff, are Iranians. Really? Yes. Yeah. Are an Iranian couple, and that they listen to Rook. Uh, oh. and, 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 like they were cited, they know episodes, they knew certain, uh, and that they're fans of Dang Show. Like they were like, you mean you're <laughs> yes. shy from Dang Show? So they were. So that was really nice. There was like, a, oh, this is great, and you know, it's, it's that this is how the diaspora has changed so much because I would never expect to go to like, like maybe go to like Persian Palace or some yeah, yeah. some you know uh, restaurant where I, of course I'm going to meet Iranian, but to go to like a sports bar and like you have just people swigging Miller yeah. beer and then and then the owners turn out to be Iranian very cool very cool couple really awesome people but see then then I feel I feel bad because I felt like they had obligatory taught off requirements then right because now Reza Shai and I are there and they've said oh we listen to Rook and we like so now they have to like you know let us bring you thing. Um, and, and we were like no you don't have it. but but so they end up Full on Pazirai, like we basically <laughs> oh have a God. Mahmouni at St. Louis, <laughs> right? But instead of Tadik and Qayme and Mastikhar, it's like onion rigs and guacamole and <laughs> burritos and wigs. No chai? Uh, uh, no chai, but, <laughs> no and, chai. and they would be like, honestly, like I have to say, I felt a little sick after uh, about 24 <laughs> hours afterwards. So Not much. to take anything away from the great food, or <laughs> but we ate so much. And every time they would be like, Hob, uh, Jianjun, you, uh, uh -huh, you like things spicy? And I'd be like, well, yeah, and then they'd be like, "Have we brought you some jalapeno <laughs> poppers that would extra spice?" Yeah. You know? And it was just like mounds of things on the table, like full on Persian style. That sounds incredible. So we were just eating, and uh, I mean, this is if you're in the Toronto area, I got to 
give a shout out to these guys. It's at the Atrium on Bay, you know, like uh, Bay and Dundas. Oh, down the downtown location. Bay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm, Atrium, okay. Atrium on Bay. If if you're ever downtown in Toronto, there's a St. Louis there. In fact, the Raptors are are, are playing right now. They're they're in the, the the playoffs. We should maybe think about and going there. Again. Cheesecake yeah. is really good. And yeah, well, I would yeah. love to yeah. come Then after next all time. that, it was like whole dessert. <laughs> you know, they're <laughs> 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 just like yeah, it was. And they'd be like, "Have you tried the, this flavor of chicken wings?" We'd be like, "No, maybe next time." No, no, I mean, I no. Right I think so. Honestly, so I good. think Shia, who was riding his bike, went home with like a knapsack full of chicken <laughs> wings <laughs> because yeah. we felt That's bad. True. They had brought us so many chicken wings. I think there's only so much That's three true. overeating just, men can eat. You know, <laughs> and you're forced to eat it. I but guess. I, I loved. I just loved the fusion of this traditional what we would think of as western you know bar fare with persian hospitality you know so it was just like with the mahmoudi at the yeah, st louis yeah. chicken wings place you know yeah. anyways it was a great it was sounds a, it was like a, a beautiful night it was I a wish fun I was night we ate a lot we did miss you uh and uh we have to go back there and, yeah. and watch and and again i mean atrium on bay st louis uh, shout out to those guys if you if you're in the toronto area go uh have some of their amazing food and uh watch your sports games there all right just thinking about it though man the I next know. day i i don't think i i stopped i i didn't eat for about 48 hours after that no i was i was like, i was going, considering you guys suicide had to keep i really eating everything they brought in of course you, you feel bad you yeah. can't let it go to waste let's see you know like and then but she had to go to the in honey master do start she that hard and i'm like okay yeah i'll have some of that you know and like so i was just like eating like like 90 percent of my body composition was chicken wing you know by the end of the night jean flew away i had so much Right, right. Oh, they were so kind and lovely. Aww. They were, lo- were the best. Names? They're the best. What were their last names? Uh, I don't know their last names. Hmm. Well, but, I'm uh, not sure if they are. They want us to talk about their names, no, but their location no, no, is no. at Atrium. For the Atrium, yeah. okay. I'm yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. I don't know even sure if they're always there. I think they just happen to be there that really? night. That, yeah. I don't know if they actually. That's I true. mean, they we, own I mean, the place. But, yeah, yeah. We didn't ask them if they're. But yeah, they were the best. They were the Aww. best. This cool like Iranian couple yeah. who you know own a St. Louis. You're right. You wouldn't expect no, that. No, you would so, <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, the team is here. We have Lily Afshar coming up in just a little bit. But first, it's time for letters of the week. Okay, so this week on episode 42, we had an interview with Jimmy Del Shad, the charming former mayor of Beverly Hills, and I have to say probably my newest favorite person. Oh, really? <laughs> I want to be friends with him. Yeah, he's so I'm great. So oh. Lovable. Yeah, and I I'm love that he's just a box of history. Yeah. Anyway, so we have a few people that wrote about that specific episode. We have Nazila Rafizadeh. She said... It's unfortunate that these wonderful, professional, and humble people are working around the world in foreign countries. Just imagine how many priceless and talented people Iran has lost during the last 40 years. Jimmy could have been the mayor of Tehran, for example. Mm. It's true. Although he left before the last 40 years. And he yeah. probably prefer to be the mayor. Of well, <laughs> <laughs> well, had he have gone back and yes, the revolution yes, didn't yes. happen. The point yeah. was well taken. Yeah. Thank you, Nazila Jan. Cool. And then we have Mariam Del. She wrote, amazing interview with an amazing individual. Thank you, Gian, for letting us get to know these wonderful people more in depth. Thank you, Mariam. Cool. As well, last week on episode 41, we had an interview with Behdad Esfabud the uh, tech genius and former Google employee who was detained by the Islamic Revolutionary Guards on his recent trip to Iran. As well, we had Iranian-American comedian Melissa Shoshahi on the show. And also we had psychotherapist Ali Reza Tahiri join us for a roundtable discussion, which, uh, which I think added to the yeah. roundtable situation. We should always have a therapist on board, you know, <laughs> analyze... Yeah, team. he came on because we wanted to talk about the the extreme um, mm. mental uh, duress that Behdad Esfepov was put under by the IRGC and and all that he's gone through that mm-hmm. whole ordeal. That's why that was a precipitant for bringing Dr. Ali Reza Tahiri on as a psychotherapist. Mm-hmm. But he really what became the psychotherapist of me, <laughs> Reza, and Shia, right? And yeah. somewhat, I mean, yeah, you a little know, bit. I went home and thought about a lot of things. Like, oh my god! So How much yeah, we should just have. 
him. I mean, on board. <laughs> I don't know if he'd be up for coming every week. He's <laughs> like, I got a job, guys. Sorry, I know. but it was very nice to have yeah. him here. Yeah. Well, so we have a Saleh Raj- Rajai on Facebook wrote, "Dear Behdad Esfabud, gold is tested by fire. Your authenticity and bravery is so inspiring to our new generation of Iranians. Thank you." Beautiful note. Thank you for that, Saleh. All right, then we have Ali Khalili on YouTube wrote, It was great to have Ali Reza Tahiri on board for this episode, which in my opinion made this interview more educational than just entertaining and informative. And from the round table, I get more curious to hear the stories of the Rook team. <laughs> Are you going to have an extra episode with a third party interviewing the Rook team? I didn't know Shaya is the son of Ali Reza Shoja Nuri, mm. a famous and great Iranian actor. I always thought Shaya is his last name. <laughs> and in my opinion, the second part with Melissa could be a whole episode on Iranian female comedians and the challenges they face. That's true. We should mm-hmm. do more uh, with uh, Iranian female comedians for sure in the future. Yeah. Uh, I, that's not the first person who said that. Shaya is yes. kind of your last name because you're Reza Shaya, right? Yes, yes. Actually, my birth name is Reza. I told in the second episode yeah. or third episode, yeah, my, my birth name is Reza, but my friends and... Uh, all the music industry called me Shaya. Yeah. Mm. And Shaya, you're the son of a famous Iranian actor. I had no idea. Yes. There we go. Huh. Yes. And Look Shaya is your stage Actually, name or no? Is your, like, it's kind of my nickname. 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 Yeah. Gotcha. Huh. Where did that come from, Shaya? Um, <laughs> Actually, Shoja in Slav pronunciation came to Shaya, changed oh. to Shaya, oh. and so the the last name is Shoja Nuri. Yes. Yeah. So you're you were Reza Shoja Nuri. Yes. And you became Reza Shaya. Yes. yes. Wow. Mm. But did you do you not like us to know about your dad? Um, I, no, mean, I, not, I, I mean us. You don't mind, but I mean uh, uh, nobody's listening, so it's okay. <laughs> no, no. Do you do, no? I mean, do you uh, uh, do you not want? Um, in general when you were doing dank show or did you are you one of those sons of a famous person you don't want to be uh, you, you know yes yeah, so you know in iran i don't want to be the son of somebody because i am not not i'm somebody but i am dank show and i don't want to um be uh, trading on the celebrity yes, of your father yeah. yes yes but uh, here no actually i love my father and actually his latest movie which he produced is on uh, online screaming in North America and I, I would oh. and yeah. I suggest what is it called people plug it in what is it called um, uh, African Velvet African, African Velvet, Velvet. Yeah. sounds cool mm. African Purple so African, African Purple <laughs> <laughs> are you okay. sure he's your father <laughs> <laughs> <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> are you sure this is a film <laughs> 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 uh, okay, okay. African wow. Purple yeah. the things you Still learn cool. I don't think it's African Purple that would say Purple like Africa? <laughs> yeah. Purple Africa. That African makes Velvet more sense. sounds like a better title. Yeah. yeah. Tell your dad that you go with every African Velvet. <laughs> a little too late, yet. probably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll have to look that up. Why doesn't he cast uh, Captain Reza? Captain Reza is right? a good actor. Come on. He cast yes. him in some films. Next movie. Next movie. <laughs> Yay. But Reza, you work in uh, in English. You don't do and work in Farsi. No, I haven't. I my first my very first movie, Lost Journey, was in Farsi. Was in Farsi. Farsi. Right? Well, it wasn't a Farsi movie, it was an English movie, but the <gasps> language was I Farsi. think I've seen that movie. No with way. Shiva Nigar? That's right. Oh my god, that was you? That's me. Oh Chubby god. Reza. Chubby. You have to I have like no idea. <laughs> how many months are you gonna be on the show before? It's been you? a year. <laughs> we'll be working together. She's like, oh my god. It just hit me. I was forced to watch this movie. You know, my parents <laughs> literally. Because you know, they would force us to go to Iranian movies. They're like, oh, this new Iranian movie. Andy's in it, by the way. Oh, um, and oh that's right. Yeah. Andy's in it. Yeah, Andy's yeah. in it, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Dear wow. friend. Yeah. And uh, a young Reza. I'm yeah. like starstruck now. Wow, that was you? That's right. I like how Keon's suddenly more interested in you guys. I know. Like, now that you you have a better personalities, now that he, he, she knows that you've like actually that. done something interesting. She didn't want to say hello to me when she walked into the studio. You now really didn't like, say hello to Reza for the first time. I always <laughs> said hi. What are you talking about? No, you are, are very just, kind. Yeah. You're very nice. I, I yeah. like to find out things organically. I don't want to Google everybody. Oh, well. like, it's just yeah. nicer. All right. Yeah. Cool. Uh, moving on, we have a Marlene Khoury on YouTube Row. As difficult as it was to listen to the immense pain in this interview, I am glad to hear the psychological eff- effects of trauma being discussed on the show. It's dialogue that needs to occur. Captain Reza was ex- exact on how trauma keeps re-violating and controls individuals. It's the worst form of abuse. 
It is interviews such as this that help us understand trauma and initiate an open dialogue that start essential healing all to build resilience. Thanks for that, Marlene. And then, wow, we have the letter of the week. I really enjoyed reading this, actually. So this is from Tiam Kukpari. He emailed us. Um, He says, My name is Tiam. I am an Iranian grad student from Vancouver. I just wanted to send a thank you email for creating your podcast series, which I discovered in the past two days on YouTube. As a young Iranian in the diaspora who has never been to Iran, I feel like this is just what our community needs, an in-depth look at successful Iranians. I think this is great not just to show young Iranians what they have the potential to achieve, but in some ways it also acts as a unifying message. I especially appreciated your discussion with Abbas Milani about the need for a unified opposition from outside Iran. I also need to commend you on the actual production, the sound, your voice, the music, and in brackets, he has, please, more Fere Dun Fururi, the visual introduction. It's all so fantastic. Thank you again so much and keep up the awesome work. Thank you. Beautiful. Tiam. Beautiful. Yeah. That's really, really, really kind. Really nice to, to hear people discovering it like that. Thank you for the kind words. And info at rookmedia.com is how to reach us. Info at rookmedia.com or post on any of our platforms, including Telegram now. Uh, thanks, Kion, for reading the letter from Tiam. Thank you, Gian. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for that. Uh, the fabulous Kion will return next week. Uh, Captain Reza, Groovy Shia. Thank you both. Well, my next guest is an Iranian-American born in Tehran who is simply one of the best female classical guitarists in the world. Take a listen to this. taste of Lily Afshar from 2018 performing Asturias by I Albanese. Lily Afshar started playing the guitar in her hometown of Tehran at the age of 10, moved to the United States at the age of 17, and was the first woman in the world to achieve a doctorate of music in guitar performance. She was selected as one of the top 10 guitarists in the world to play for Maestro Andreas Segovia in his master classes held at the University of Southern California. Lily has won numerous prizes in music competitions, including the 2011 Distinguished Alumni Award from the Boston Boston Conservatory, the 2000 Orville H. Gibson Award for Best Female Classical Guitarist in Los Angeles. She's also a three-time winner of the annual Premier Guitarist Awards given by the Memphis chapter of the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences, and she was chosen as Artistic Ambassador for the United States Information Agency to Africa. Lily Afshar has appeared in recitals and concerts at various venues around the world, including the Wigmore Hall in London, the Kennedy Center for Performing Arts, the Aspen Music Festival, Banff School of Fine Arts, the Menton Music Festival in the south of France, and the American Academy in Rome. She has five recordings and two books to her credit, which have attracted international critical acclaim. Today, Lily is head of the University of Memphis Guitar Program, and she regularly conducts guitar master classes in conjunction with her touring and right now lily afshar joins me from memphis tennessee hello hello how are you i'm well it's i'm i'm very happy to have you on the program thank you for doing this 
Oh, it's a pleasure. Yeah, I have to make a correction to the bio you read. I have actually seven CDs, not five. <laughs> okay, we underestimated you. Uh, five, rec seven recordings. We'll fix that for sure. Um, uh, Lily, it's uh, mesmerizing listening to what you do. First of all, we're living in this moment of COVID and this pandemic. Uh, which has affected musicians in all kinds of ways, especially those who do live concerts. Um, so I was assuming this had curbed your ability to do some of what you do in the interim. But is it true that you went to Iran in recent months? Yes. And what was that like? It was actually very nice. And uh, I uh, taught uh, classes in three different cities and... Uh, I enjoyed it. I and I, I spent the time at the Caspian Sea and went swimming, and it was very nice. So you weren't um, you weren't intimidated or scared to be traveling uh, during this period when? No, no, I wasn't. No. And did you? And I mean, we hear conflicting reports about the state of COVID in Iran. Did it feel? basically the same as the United States to you there in terms of the level of of, of the pandemic? Or did you feel uh, more scared being there? I wasn't scared at all, no. I, I, I wasn't uh, in the public, per se. You know, I wasn't hanging out with many people or in groups. So I was mostly b uh, by myself and I kept my distance. And even my classes were done, like I said, with six feet apart and uh, with uh, masks on, so it was fine. I know you go there, back there quite regularly to Iran. Do you, do you ever have issues traveling back and forth from the United States and performing in Iran? No, I don't. They've never. There's never been some kind of. You, you don't worry about. I don't know. There's so we speak to so many musicians on this program who have trepidation about going to Iran, but it seems like it's been. I okay. have no trepidation. I have. I, I travel easily and I have no problems. And they've never said anything about uh, expectations or put boundaries on what you do, or not really. I mean, uh, the you know, I, I wear my uh, rusari, my scarf there, and I I I cover up uh, when I perform, and uh, I usually don't have any issues there. <laughs> It's interesting that you live in Memphis and that you've been there for many years. You're a professor there. I, I, I guess I'm not the first person to say this. I, I think of Memphis, of course, as a music town, but one usually associates it with country music, not elegant classical guitar. How, how did you end up in Memphis? Well, first of all, Memphis is associated with the blues, not country music. Country music is Nashville. <laughs> Nashville, sorry, yes. Okay, right. fair enough. And many people make that mistake. So, no, we, we do a lot of uh, uh, blues here, but at the university, uh, of course, they teach classical, and uh, there are a few orchestras in Memphis, Memphis Symphony Orchestra, the Iris Orchestra. So there's a lot of classical music going on here as well. What was the, sorry, what was the initial precipitant for you going to Memphis? Was it the professorship? Yes, I got this job uh, the day after I got my doctorate. So I moved to Memphis. I really didn't know anything about Memphis except that Elvis lived here. <laughs> right. So right. Uh, I had to actually look it up on the map. And uh, But they wanted me here, so I moved here, and it's been good. And I've stayed here now 31 years. By the way, that's uh, um, I I'm not sure you know how lucky you are as someone who has a couple of professors in my family who spent um, um, a fair bit of time after getting their PhD um, hoping to get a job and until they finally landed one. Uh, that's not so bad the day after you graduate to, to, to have a plum gig. Yeah, it was like made for me, you know. <laughs> Is there much of a Persian community in Memphis? I would say about a thousand. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's probably grown in the last 30 years you've been there, too. Yeah, well, it's grown to a thousand. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, from zero. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. What, it wasn't zero. No, not, when you went there, were you, how many Persians were there in town when you got to Memphis? I, I understand there were a lot during the time of the Shah because uh, they would get scholarship and come to the university. 
for example, as far as I know, we have more than 30 students now studying engineering at the University of Memphis. We have some Iranian professors, and in town there are a lot of families with kids. So there are quite a bit that we have a, even an Iranian association of Memphis. So oh, wow. it's enough to have an association. And are you involved in that? Are you known as the local? Once in a while, I performed. I performed for them once in a while. You know, you are remarkable at what you do. And when someone is a virtuoso, it's often assumed that they have this gift that was within them from childhood. And your story is something like that. Tell me what happened at 10 years old when you saw your cousin taking a guitar lesson. Yeah, I was visiting my cousin and I attended her uh, guitar lesson and she couldn't do the things that the teacher told her. Uh, so I wanted to uh, grab the guitar from her and play it myself. And I, I felt this incredible uh, urge to do that. So I ran home and told my father, Daddy, I love the guitar. And the next day he surprised me with her guitar <laughs> in a basket uh, with her music book. And that's when I started playing the guitar. He, he got me a teacher and that's... That's where how it started. So one of the consequences of you learning uh, you, your desire for guitar was that your cousin was stripped of her guitar? <laughs> Apparently, she wasn't that interested. So. <laughs> Nijah Dadi, you, 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 you freed her from having to play, play, play the guitar. Uh, yes. So, yes. So, so just so I get the story right, so you didn't, you were not, you, you had not played the guitar before, and yet your instinct was to, to want to pick it up and take it away from her and, and play it? Yes, we had music in the house. We had piano in the house. We had violin. We even had a, somebody played folk guitar. But I would always listen and just listen from afar, you know. But it was that classical guitar, the beautiful sound of the classical guitar that triggered me into wanting to play it. And it was the instrument I really wanted to play. I, I discovered it right there and then. And then I started listening to Segovia recordings and it all, a whole new world was opened for me. I was actually thinking about that because you were, I'm, I'm guessing this is now, it's the early 70s, and I'm wondering why uh, a little girl in Tehran who um, could be starting to get into Persian pop music of the time or uh, wh why you would gravitate towards classical music and classical guitar. Do you know what it was about it that captured your imagination? It was the beautiful sound of the classical guitar. It has a special sound, you know, like if I just play the open strings here. This beautiful sound is what I wanted. And uh, it's just, I love, fell in love with it. It was love at first sight. What can I say? Because like I said, we had folk guitar, that's with steel strings. Right. But that didn't, I, I was not interested in playing and singing. But classical guitar, has a different warmer quality and you can play it by yourself and you don't have to sing so uh that's what it just spoke to me right there and then you know what's amazing about the texture of the sound that you make um in some cases i was going to get to this one we're going to play a, a bit of another song from you but but um honestly it's sometimes because i'm I, I know nylon string guitars or, or classical uh, guitars the sound sometimes can um, not be as pointed as it is with you. It, it, in some of your performances, it almost sounds like you're playing a piano. It's quite remarkable. What is that sound that we're hearing? Well, we spend many, many hours and years working on our tone uh, with the classical guitar. Uh, the, the beauty of the classical guitar is the tone that you produce on it. And it has to do with the shape of your nails in the right hand and uh, how you strike the strings. So we spent many, many, many years perfecting that tone. Each person has their own special tone. You want to shoot for a warm, well-rounded tone. And that's why it sounds like a piano. It's a full, rich-bodied tone. 
to be honest, I'm. It's one of the first times I've heard classical guitar that way. Listening to you play that piano sound, it, it's it's almost shocking in some cases in some of your pieces. To to to, it's also the facility, the way you're playing it. Um, it's almost shocking sometimes to think that you're picking on a guitar. It, it's it's a really interesting. I mean, I'm guessing I'm not the first person who's said this to you about the uh, piano sound. Well, yeah, that that's that's about right. Uh, it sounds like a piano, or sometimes some pieces they say it sounds like two guitars. But you see, maybe you've been listening mostly to flamenco or uh, jazz or pop. Uh, classical is a very quiet instrument, and uh, when when somebody plays classical guitar, you don't speak, you don't make noise, you just listen to in order to be able to hear all the intricacies of the instrument and there are a lot of intricacies and uh, so uh, that's what's special about this instrument it's just a very quiet delicate instrument but it sounds like a small orchestra hmm. so when you gravitate towards it as a as a kid your dad gets you that guitar um when did the time come when you realized that this is not just something that uh, you fancy and that you're enjoying and that that you had asked your dad to you know for or told your dad that you love, but something that could actually be something that will become your career? Well, right away, I would lock myself up in my room and not come out. Uh, I would spend many, many hours behind the closed door uh, just trying to discover this guitar and play all the notes on all the fret and listen carefully to every note ringing wow. and uh, it was like a magic box to me and my father would say lily come out of your room so we can see you because i would just stay there lock myself up <laughs> and uh, i gave up skiing i gave up uh, painting i gave up a lot of things I, I just focused on the guitar it was my life from the beginning um, now, I didn't know that you could study this as a degree uh, in college. I didn't know you could major in it while I was living in Iran. It was only after I came to the U.S. that I discovered, oh, yes, you can get a degree in classical guitar. And that's when I went to Boston Conservatory to study it. I'm going to ask you about that, but before that, just this this image of you in your bedroom with the door closed. Um it feels like it's quite a solitary uh, experience, um, uh, what you do with the, with the classical guitar. I mean, partly because most of the time we see you perform, there might be one other person or a couple of other people on stage, but, but you are alone. Uh, and also because of um, the, the regimen of it, um, you don't really, uh, I'm guessing you don't, you don't go into it expecting that you're going to be in a band. You, you go into it wanting to experience the majesty of what you're doing alone. So is it an instrument that when you're teaching that you kind of have to um, warn extroverts about or people who are in need of a lot of attention that this is going to require a lot of private time? People who play classical guitar know that it's going to take many years to perfect and that they need to put in the time and the discipline to practice. You don't go in a practice room with other people. You have to go by yourself. And practicing takes a lot of time, a lot of thinking, a lot of repetition. And uh, you just, you know that. I mean, it's not just specific to classical guitar. It's specific to violin and other instruments, sure. piano. Sure. Uh, if, if you want to, you know, make it your profession but uh people know that and they're willing to put in the time because the satisfaction of improving and getting better at it is much more than the time that you put in if you're really into it you'll never say oh my god i practice i have to go practice you just go do it i understand but i can tell you as a as a drummer um, <laughs> at 10 years old, uh, it implicated the whole house when I was practicing my drums. I couldn't go quietly do it in a private way and in, in my bedroom. Right. So, um, Which that, yeah, that's the beauty of the classical guitar. It doesn't bother anybody. You can get up at 4 a.m. and just play softly by yourself. And I've done that many times. And it just really suits my uh, personality to have something that's mine and I don't have... A, 
you know, I can spend many hours with it. And then when I'm ready, I go share it on stage with everyone. You're co- you're someone who's comfortable being alone. Yes. You know, the traditional, I know you come from a a, a good, well-off, a, a pro- prominent uh, Iranian family. So I'm I'm sure on some level or another, uh, you or, or family members would have expected to, to go into certain professions that, uh, you know, the middle and middle upper, upper class Iranians are always expected to do. Were they supportive of a, of a prospective music career for you? Yes, I never had, nobody ever told me what to go study, really. I made up my own mind and I was supported, yes. So tell me about leaving Iran in the period before the revolution. What what was the uh, the precipitant for leaving and what do you remember about that time? Well, in my family, we always went to Europe or the U.S. to go to college and it was just a tradition. So I went to uh an international high school in Tehran. And once I finished, uh, during the time I, on my 12th grade, I was applying to colleges in the U.S. And it, so when I got accepted, I left. And I'm assuming you're, you, you went, your family stayed in Iran. Yeah, I mean, they didn't have to come with me, right. Well, so because you wouldn't return to Iran for about 20 years. So uh, I'm not sure if you knew at the time when you were leaving that this was going to be um, you were going to be leaving the country for a long time. No, um, I didn't know. And I got the summer of my freshman year. And then that was the last time I went back because the revolution broke after that. And then I just stayed in the States. How quickly did you assimilate? I, I, you know, I was watching um, old videos of you that you were already playing for Segovia by the mid 1980s. So, so I, I, I'm guessing you adjusted pretty well. Did music help your assimilation into America? Well, you know, the guitar has opened has always opened doors for me. I've, I've met many people through the guitar, and uh, I've traveled because of the guitar and. I've, you know, I when I was a student, I a lot of competitions, guitar competitions. So I would meet other uh, guitarists and teachers. Uh, you know, I I traveled all the time because of the guitar. I, I even studied in Europe, in Italy, uh, for example, because of my guitar. I went to academy in Siena three years, and I would say it opened many doors. I won many competitions, and I met many people. What was it like um, after after twenty years of of being in the states and and uh, you decide you'll go back to Iran for the first time? This is during uh, Khatami. Uh, um, what, what was it like to go back for the first time? It was exhilarating and uh, it was exciting. I had uh, my concert there, and there were many family members and guitarists there. Uh, for me, Iran had changed a lot and I was experiencing it again. I mean, I would try and go to the old streets that I knew and I couldn't find my way around. I I must say everything had changed. So I was trying to learn about it again from the beginning. Your first concert was back at, at Rudecky Hall, right? Yes. And tell me how an audience affects you. I mean, uh, do you, when you're playing the classical guitar, does it matter who the audience is? And did it, was it somehow different playing for an Iranian audience for the first time? I mean, an Iranian audience in Iran for the first time in a couple of decades? Well, yes, uh, it was, I was going back to the, my country. Uh, it was it was a dream that I had uh, when I was a kid. I, I dreamt that I would perform all over Iran. And that was my goal. One day to be so good that I would just play concerts all over Iran. And finally, I had come to play my first concert there. Uh, and the other thing is that my family members, a lot of them were sitting in the audience. So I had to, that was kind of distracting for me. I wasn't used to seeing family members. And I had to really focus hard not to uh, get thrown off (laughs) when I was performing. 
when uh, of course uh, you get it's like what's what's she been up to for the last 20 years you wanted to deliver when you talk about being a a kid and dreaming of of touring and and which you've now something you've you've gone on to accomplish uh were you always i mean i i don't want you to be uh, uh don't worry about being immodest or uh, here were you always good at this i mean was it obvious to your friends say in tehran when you were 14 or 15 years old that lily is going to be one of the best in the world at this it was obvious i think to my father uh, who who uh, saw me really diligently working on the guitar um i think my friends uh didn't really know how far i could go because they didn't really know nobody knew uh they 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 thought it was really interesting that i played guitar and was constantly practicing and uh playing some concerts um uh, they didn't have the insight to know about the future but my father did and he encouraged me he said uh keep diligence and you'll reach an international level is your father a musician yes uh he played violin and piano but he was also an engineer so he recognized musically how how good you were yes he recognized and he knew me well and he put me on the right path and encouraged me when necessary are your parents still around no ah oh. Uh, I want to play a little taste of something, uh, Lily, from 2008 uh, that I found on YouTube that was really, really engrossing for me. Take, take a listen to this. That's Lily Afshar and something called Five Popular Persian Ballads. Of course, we just played a little taste of it there. It, it goes on. I, I just find that so captivating, that this piece of music. What can you tell us about this? This piece is called Dare Nejan, as is June, and it's a Persian folk song. The, the whole thing is that there wasn't any Persian music that was well arranged for the classical guitar that I could play in concerts. I was playing music from all over the world, but I didn't have anything Persian. So I decided to arrange some Persian folk music. And this one is from Mazandaran, uh, north, you know, along the Caspian Sea. And the, the melody is this. <laughs> And then I decided to turn this into a tremolo piece. And uh, one day I was walking in the supermarket and I just heard it in my head. And I came back home and wrote it down. Like that. And that's a tremolo technique, which is exclusive to the classical guitar, these repeated past repeated notes and it turned out a beautiful piece after that it, it's played a lot by different people i love it i love it so much i love what you just played it it's killing me that you're not in the studio with us so we could just uh, <laughs> ha have you play full pieces here and, and uh, i wouldn't even talk to you i just say okay just play so so um but that's really interesting so there's is that to say that there really isn't a tradition of uh classical guitar uh in I iran until you the music is not arranged the persian music uh in this form is not arranged for the guitar i mean this is 
the concert standard, you know, the way I've done them, they're virtuosic pieces. You need a lot of technique to be able to play these. And um, I think before me, there, uh, there hasn't been anything substantial uh, that can be played on solo guitar on a concert, international concert stage. So classical guitar players in Iran would traditionally be playing things composed and arranged by, say, Europeans. Yes, there is a standard classical guitar repertory that everyone plays. They play Bach, they play uh, uh, Villa Lobos, Brazilian composer. They play music by Soar from the classical period. Uh, that's that's a Spanish composer, 18th century. They play uh, Giuliani, Italian composer. There's Carcassi, Caruli. I mean, there's standard pieces. So we can, for years I've been playing that kind of music, and I still do, but a portion of my program is always now Persian and Azeri music arranged for guitar by myself. It's so interesting because I, I don't know if you know Leila Ramazan. She she was on our program. She lives in Vienna now, but she's a uh, uh, of Iranian descent. She's a classical pianist, and her mission has been quite successfully. She's put out a couple of albums now doing this, uh, rediscovering uh, classical piano composers from Iran, Iranian classical piano, which basically. Uh, is a 20th century phenomenon uh, yes, and, and yes. is different from, you, you know, uh, piano, classical piano in, in other parts of the world. Uh, what's interesting about that is she's excavating music that was already in existence. You're creating this, is what you're saying. You're you're actually creating yes. a, a new canon of um, Persian arrangements of classical guitar. That's fantastic. Yes, and Azari, Azari arrangements. From oh. Azerbaijan, yes. And and is your is your family Azeri? Yes. Ah, as is my mother. She'll be very happy at this news. Great. <laughs> yeah, my last name is my f full last name is Afshar Azardot. Means ah. I am Azeri. Ah. I, I love the idea that you only have one guitar. I found this quite shocking because yeah. most people in your position, uh, I, I mean, we had our dear friend Bob Akamini on the show uh, a couple of uh, months ago. And of course, he has this lineup of guitars. You know, he has a, a room in his house with all his guitars. Like most uh, professional musicians, they've got a number. Tell me about the, the I don't know, the, the magic or the, uh, uh, the intention between having... Uh, one guitar look do you, uh, do you change your best friend or do you keep him forever it's like that you know i mean it's my best friend and when i play on some other guitar i feel like uh uh you know first of all it's it's not doing me any justice because it's I, I haven't seen anything better than my guitar i'm comfortable with my guitar we're friends we know each other we I've been playing on my guitar since 1992 and uh, you know I know what to do to what kind of a sound from my guitar where to put my hand my right hand and where to uh, and I, I feel confident with it so I'm not going to change it just because there are many other guitars around I'm guessing you have a really um, well thought out way of maintaining this guitar making sure that this guitar never gets into any trouble basically don't hand it to anyone <laughs> right that's why you have it in your hands right now so you don't even have a backup i mean you don't have a if you're doing a concert there's not a second guitar sitting on the side of the stage in case something happens a string breaks uh uh the, this guitar stops working somehow something happens no no i don't need to do that i haven't ever had that issue if a string breaks i change it uh, there's a way I maintain my strings. I mean, I won't go on stage with bad strings. So everything's always ready to go. So nothing bad like that ever happens. Besides, my guitar is a, has a special construction and it's made especially for me. And not, not every guitar is built this way. And it's, I'm comfortable with the way this is built. And Sorry, how is it made for you? You mean it's size? It's like a particular size? Yeah. No, it, it's not the size. It's the neck. The neck is the special construction. It's called the Millennium Model uh, made by Thomas Humphrey. And 
the neck is raised you go up uh the neck is raised off the face of the guitar and it, you just have to see it i can't explain it on you know online and how does that benefit you to to have the neck raised it benefits me in that uh it the guitar projects much better and it's easier to play huh and w- what's the name of your guitar Millennium Model by Thomas Humphrey. No, I mean the name. You have a name for your guitar, don't you? It's Lily. <laughs> and where'd you get that name? <laughs> I got it from Lily. <laughs> yes. I, I was seeing if you could have any uh, appreciation for my humor. Uh, um, well, I have watched your collaboration with Nam Ju. Um, and uh-huh. t- tell me about the energy you get from pushing musical boundaries by uh, by playing with others. Is that something that you want to pursue more? Yeah, uh, I had fun doing that uh, impromptu performance with Mr. Namju. You know, we never practiced or anything. Oh, I asked really? him, I said, can we practice, go, go through these pieces once? He says, no, no, no. Let's just go on stage. Oh, I didn't know that. And as a classical musician, I'm not, I'm not used to that. You know, we practice for hours beforehand. But I, I said, okay. And we went up and uh, he had his setar and I had my guitar and we just played. Uh, I played some of these arrangements I had made and he, he just went along on the setar with me. And it was really thrilling. It was spontaneous. It was fun. I had no idea that was freeform, that that was uh, improvisational. I thought that I thought for sure. Yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, it was. So, yeah. Lily, before I let you go, uh, you you you've alluded to this, but you are. I understand you're working on a new album of Iranian and Azeri folk songs that you want to record on your next trip back to Iran. Is that right? Correct. Yes. So tell t- first of all, tell me what this what these songs are. Are they songs that are already written, or are you composing them? Where they're already written, this is folk music. Folk music, you know, has been around for a long, long time. And I take this folk music, I take the melody, I, I put harmony to it, and I adapt it for the guitar, make a new piece out of it. This is called arranging. And uh, that's what I did with that and John, for example, that you played. And uh, I use different uh, techniques of the guitar, like tremolo, harmonics. And I I use this and make it a a piece that it's as if it's written for the guitar by the time I'm done with it. Yes, I I do know what arranging is. I I thought um, I was suggesting that maybe you were writing something in this style of uh, Azari folk song since you, uh, um, uh, do 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 you compose ever? A lot of the arranging has composing composing in it because what are you going to do with just a line of melody? Uh You have to add your own composition to it. For example, me making that Daranajan into a tremolo piece is a composition. Right. And uh, it's a composition together with arranging. They go hand in hand. I have the material, but I'm the one who you know, designs it and puts it together in a new format. And why do you why do you feel like you need to record that in Iran? Well, I have a contact in a recording studio. I've I've done CDs there before. My th- CD One Thousand One Nights had been done there, and uh, I've published there. So I'm very active there and. I have three months of the summer, so I can use the time to do the recording there. It's a good pleasure to get to talk to you and to hear a little bit about your process and what you do. Thank you for your time today. Do you, we want to go out on some music by uh, Lily Afshar. Do you have a current favorite from your, uh, I mean, I've got the four records that are on Spotify, but um, uh, that's I'm limited to that, but I can we can pull something off YouTube. Do you have a something currently that you really like that you'd like us to play? You can play Recuerdos de la Alhambra. It's on my Jug of Wine CD. And that uses that tremolo piece that sounds like two guitars. Lily, thank you so much for this today. You're welcome. Hope to see you soon. Merci. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.
That's the outstanding guitarist Lily Afshar, also the head of the uh, University of Memphis Guitar Program. She joined us from Memphis, Tennessee today. Thank you so much to everybody for listening. This is Full Time for Rook for today. Remember to subscribe, uh, share our content. Um, tell people about it uh, you can go to any of our platforms and post your comments or find us at info at rookmedia.com thanks to the whole rook team for all your hard work and uh we're going to go out on some lily afshar mizun bashin mm-hmm.